Hey guys, and welcome to today's episode of the Mogul Insider Podcast. Today, I had the pleasure of interviewing the man, the legend himself, Matthew Del Negro. This guy is most popularly known by the shows he's acted on, such as Goliath and Scandal. And in this episode, we sat down with him and spoke about his path to becoming an actor and how acting was not something he actually wanted to do. I mean, growing up, he actually believed that he'd become a lawyer. And even though he's been in so many shows up to this point, he still gets many, many rejections. And because of that, he's been inspired to create a podcast called The 10,000 No's, just due to the fact of the amount of rejections he's gotten. And as always, I hope you guys really learn something from the value we bring to you. I mean, this one is kind of different. It gives you the insight of how the Hollywood industry is and how brutal things are in the acting world and how you actually have to go through a lot just to get somewhere. So guys, pull out your notepad as always, take some notes and sit back and I hope you guys enjoy. All right guys, welcome to today's episode of Mogul Insider Podcast. I appreciate you so much for stopping by. Once again, thank you so much for listening. For all you guys, all all your supporters out there, we really appreciate your support every day and with all our episodes. And today we have a special guest. I have the pleasure of interviewing Matthew Del Negro. Most of you guys know him as an actor in the shows like Scandal, Sopranos. Did I say that correctly, man? Oh, yeah. I did? Yeah. yeah. Did I say that correctly? Like Scandal, Sopranos, and we've got Teen Wolf, many different accomplishments and a lot of different TV series and movies. Also, he has a current... He was just talking about a Netflix documentary that's coming up, so... Uh, Netflix comedy series, like, Oh, yeah. comedy series. All right, my apologies. So, yeah, we'll definitely get into that. But anyways, let's get started. I appreciate you so much for being on the Cameron, podcast, thanks, man. Thank Adam. you so much. Yeah. So a lot of people know you as this person, this familiar TV face and all that stuff. But let's let's go dig deep into you. Were, you have you have uh, two siblings. You grew up in New York, correct? Yeah. So tell me a bit about that and how that kind of turned into you moving down here to L.A. and, you know, doing all that you've done. Uh, well, I grew, yeah, I'm the youngest of three. Uh, I grew up in Westchester County, New York, a little outside New York City. Um and I, I did not know I was going to be an actor at all. Like, it just wasn't on the radar at all. I, I played sports, played a bunch of sports, and um, ended up playing lacrosse at Boston College. So I was at BC, and then between sophomore and junior year, I went to, I studied abroad in Italy, and that trip kind of ended up being a I did a real about face. I ended up writing my journal, and it was kind of like outside my my world at Boston College and just started to think about maybe getting another experience of like um, going on spring break and doing that kind of thing. Went back to BC, ended up playing fall ball and at the end of fall ball just decided I, I was I was done and ended up auditioning for a play that spring and and did a play which was kind of like total 180 from playing lacrosse people are like, yeah you were you were a lacrosse player yes yeah. so what, yes. what were your goals going to college what exactly did you want to do you know i didn't i uh my my mom's a retired special ed teacher my dad is an attorney but he kind of more the heart of like a professor or a social worker kind of like always talked about the law in a way that that made it appealing to me and i kind of thought I would be a lawyer. That was kind of the track. I, it wasn't like I was definitively going that way, but if you asked me, I'd say that was almost like, that's where I would have guessed I would have gone. And what attracted you so much about law that you wanted to Well, do? it's funny. The same kind of things that, that attract me to acting, it's the same thing. The way my dad talked about it, he, you know, he would have a client that he'd have to defend. You have to get behind that person's point of view and defend it. I, I started to realize as I got a little older, that's within the context of law. And what I do as an actor is get behind a character and defend their point of view to the world. So it's, it's kind of, I look at it in a lot in the same way of just kind of being able to grapple with psychology and then you're physically involved with it. You're, you know, spiritually involved with it. So it kind of requires all of me and I was always looking for something that was going to be that was going to that I was going to really be fully into and I did that play at BC it wasn't even on a real stage it was like in a lecture hall it was two nights of performance Mm -hmm. and I did it and I just told everybody I was going to be an actor (laughs) just just from the how old were you at this time I was uh I was 20 I was a junior in college um I was an English major I ended up taking film classes got a film studies minor and um and that was it. And, and, you know, it's, it's funny what happens when you, you say that all of a sudden people, 
people kind of want to put you in the smallest boxes they can put you into. And I, I remember I used to, I used to do, they'd be at a party and do something stupid and people, you know, you're just a jackass that did something dumb. Mm -hmm. And then once I said I was going to be an actor, you do that and people go, oh, you're such an actor. And you're like, <laughs> and you realize like people just yeah. want to, it's, it's easy for people to just to put you in a, uh, you know, categorize you as, as one thing. Um, and so I went to New York. I, I moved home. I, I made some money at home, just like working with the uh, Mason laying patios that summer and uh, started taking classes in New York City. This is after I graduated. Mm -hmm. uh, moved into New York City uh, January 1st of 1995. And I waited tables, bartended, took classes, uh, scoured through backstage looking for jobs, a lot of them for no money, and really just kind of like pounded the pavement. And learned my craft and just loved it you know it was like i was just scraping and clawing scraping and clawing I, i'd save up enough money bartending so i could go do a, a play off broadway that would be a legitimate play where you're only getting is an equity play you're getting like 236 dollars a week so i was making wow. more a night bartending than i was doing that so you had to save up money to go do a play you for like six weeks that you wanted to do because you're gonna make mm -hmm. no matter, and that was that was like the paying ones. I did tons of free gigs, free gigs, yeah, yeah. like black box theater, all of it. And then I started getting some commercials. I just take that money and stow it away, and just act like it didn't exist. And um, and, and that's what you kind of have to do, you know. Live. So how how are how are your parents about this? You know, being the youngest sibling, I'm sure. I mean, I, I'm I'm. I'm personally the older sibling in the family, so I'm yeah. more so the kind of guy that I always is like, you know, talked about, has to be the successful one, has right. like the eyes on. How is it being the younger sibling in the family and wanting to, like, were they supportive toward your, towards your ambitions and your career I, goals? I've told people many times, I, I like won the lottery, the parent lottery. My, mm -hmm. my parents are awesome. Um, and they basically told me when I, you know, you go through Boston College and it's, it's they they largely paid for it. I mean, I'm like, you know, Full disclosure, it's like I had a tiny little scholarship that covered a little bit of it, but I was very lucky. Um, and so when you go through that and then you say, I'm going to be an actor, they were, this is what they did, which was really great. They said, we support you psychologically, spiritually, all of that. Financially, you're on your own. You mm -hmm. got to figure it out. So I got a I got a rent stabilized apartment on the upper. And how did that side. feel? Being a you said twenty year old, correct? When you started uh, this I was twenty when I did that, and then I graduated college. I was like twenty one, I guess, uh, turning twenty two. And you cool. Know, so, so when you're twenty two years old, you're used to a family that's always supporting you financially. Now all of a sudden, you have to be on your own. Well, you know, correct? I always worked growing. Like I I would work uh, starting probably like seventh or eighth grade in the summers. I used to I worked. Uh, a couple of construction jobs for my friend's fathers that did construction. I did, I caddied when I was in college, I bartended and I caddied. So I always kind of had a side hustle mm -hmm. to make my own cash to like, to, to, to do, do something. My own okay. thing. So I, it wasn't like that was new to me, but now I also had to, you know, I had to make my rent and I had to do all everything else. So, um, it, it, you know, I think by the time I got there, I was prepared for it. The, the tough thing was, it was like I was living like four lives in one because you know you had to have a, a full-time job to make the money, but then I was also in acting classes, which were a couple of days a week, and then you would have, it was a scene study class, so you would have a scene partner that could live in any of the five boroughs. So sometimes you'd be hopping on a subway to go to your scene partner's place in in you know Queens or in Brooklyn or you know right there in Manhattan, and that was time. So there was all that. Then there was, I was, you know, working at California Pizza Kitchen during the day. I was bartending at a place called Black Fin and later Turtle Bay Grill and Lounge at night. And it, it was, so it was nuts. It was like I had, I was, I was basically agenting myself because I didn't have an agent yet. So I had to go through backstage and scour for different auditions and stuff. So it mm -hmm. was really, I talked to young actors and I say like, I don't know if I'm tough enough right now to do what I did back then. It was yeah, a lot. What was going on through your head that kept you motivated? I just, I just loved it. I just, I was, I don't know what it, it was kind of, I guess what we talked about earlier was I was always searching for something that would require all of me. And this was it. And I just, I just all loved of me. Do you mean like being content? Meaning like, it would use all of the the different uh, skills or um, 
aspects of myself. Like I love, as we're having this conversation, I love conversations like this. I yeah. love grappling with someone's, what makes someone tick. And that's what you do with your characters, you know, as, as an actor, you're, you're, you're analyzing a script, you're analyzing your character, you're trying to figure out a new world, so you're using your mind. But you're also, it's not just like you're writing a paper about them, you're physically embodying them and going into it, and I like that. And you know, like I said, I always played sports, so I like physically being involved. Um, there's a team aspect to it, you know, which I, all the sports I played were team sports. So it was mm -hmm. like, so there, there's that aspect of like, whether you're putting up a production, or you, you know, a play or you're doing a film, it's, it's the same kind of thing. You're coordinating with other people and yet it relies on your own performance too. Like you've got to perform when, when they say action or, or in a play, when the curtain goes up, there you are, you know, for better or for worse, which is similar again to sports. You, you know, once the game starts, you're out there and it's like, you're either getting knocked on your ass or, or you're getting back up. And I love, I love that you say that because what's very interesting to me about acting is like you got all these cameras on you and you're you're given a script. I don't know too much about behind the scenes. I mean, yeah. uh, but you're given a script and you're supposed to deliver. How is that feeling when you first begun? Like, were you very nervous? Like, how did that entire yeah. process feel like? You're over here working so many jobs, yeah. trying to figure things out, getting free gigs left and right. Right. Did you ever have moments where you just felt like, oh, God, this is too much? Oh, yeah, man. I mean, I've had moments where, you know, I, I feel like I have stories for days about, like, you know, good and bad. Times when I was, like, in my, in my instinct and I really let it go. And I probably was so dumb and naive that it actually worked to my advantage. <laughs> honestly, honestly, bliss, totally, huh? totally, yeah. totally. And then there are other times where... You know, you just uh, swing and miss, and uh, and there are other times when you're just incredibly nervous. Um, I mean, you're just making me think of the first, one of the first TV gigs I had uh, was Law and & Order, and it was, and I was playing, it was like not, not much of a role, and and like I remember getting there, it was like downtown at the the courthouse, somewhere near the courthouse, and I was so green that I didn't even realize what we were doing. What I ended up getting really nervous about was a rehearsal. It was like a, a camera rehearsal. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, boo, 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 heart palpitating. And, and you have like your sides, you know, you have the scene. And I yeah. didn't even really have that much to do. And we're kind of going around and it got to me. I just remember really being nervous and like, and then they were like, okay, uh, let's go back. You know, we'll be back and you know, we're going to light it and we're going to shoot it. And I was like, Oh, like I was that green that I did. I was like, oh, I'm getting all nervous for this. It's a rehearsal. Yeah. I, it was just, it's, it's, it's kind of unbelievable when I think back now how little I knew, you know. Um, sometimes that serves you and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but so what would, what would Matthew today tell Matthew when you first started? I, I, would, I would say, um, you know, if, you, if you're really enjoying it, you know, and you do need to, you have to keep checking in with yourself to see that you're really still inspired. And you, you don't want to be hanging on to something that because you said you were going to do it, you have to really want to do it. But, but if that's the case, you just keep taking one step after the other and you, you will get better, you will learn more, you will meet people that will help you along the way. That That's kind of the the premise of my whole podcast. Mm -hmm. I mean, 10,000 knows. That's well, what we'll get is. into that. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's, that, that's what I would say to people is like, if you, if you really want it, you know, you, you can, you can get what, whatever you want. If you, if you're a combination of, you know, um, resilient, you gotta be resilient. You gotta, you gotta have perseverance. It's, it's what I said to you about setting this whole thing up. Mm -hmm. You were just, you, you came after it and you, you made it easy for me to say yes. There mm -hmm. were many times when we were about to set this up and I was like, ah, I'm yeah, busy, yeah, yeah. I don't know what. And you made it easy for me. You, you just, you, you kind of in a respectful way kept on pushing. And I that's what I would that. say. You. That would be, yeah, no, that would be my advice to people that are young and getting into it. It's like, you, you have to have like, there's a certain hard-headedness that you have to have. It's a st certain stupidity. In a it, it, it is. You it know, is, it's yes, like it you, you need to, because it's like delusional. It's like and, no matter what, this is going to happen. Like, yeah, it's, you know? it's, in a way, it's delusional because you're basically, you have this vision of something you want and it doesn't exist. 
And the world is telling you you're nuts. That like, what are you talking about? You're not gonna do. You're not gonna be on TV. You're not gonna do that. Yeah. And it's like, well, how? Why would you do that? And you're just basically saying like, okay, yep, that's great. And pushing that aside and moving forward. And on the other hand, there there has to be a a sensitivity to what's working and what's not, and and who the smart people are that are. Uh, in your field that are where you want to go and and learning from them and realizing you don't have to reinvent the wheel you have to you have to get help but you have to get help from the right people is that i see a lot of people in in my industry in particular they're they're young and they're naive and they just get hoodwinked by someone who you know I don't know, claims to have answers and they're like they're just it's it's sad to see mm-hmm. people can play on people's desires in this business i think you know they can they, they can play on their naivete and they and they can really it's 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 uh, you're selling them a dream yeah in a sense and people will willingly go if they really want something they're willing to follow people and sometimes they're following the wrong people down the wrong path and you're like oh so how are you able to kind of filter the wrong from the right out Huh. Or did you just get lucky? Like, is there even such thing as luck in this industry kind of thing? Uh, I mean, I, th- I think there is. I mean, I don't believe be, in I luck. I think you it's could like... be fortunate, but I, I really believe in that old, the old saying about, like, you know, luck is preparation meeting hard opportunity. Work, yeah. Preparation yeah. meets opportunity. Yeah. There's plenty. Of, everybody's going to get their shot where the wheel's going to come around for them. Are you ready for it? You know? Interesting. Um, so and, that's how you thought of it while you were doing that's it? A, my, I've had like, you know, for better or for worse, I've had like the Rocky Balboa approach to my career, which mm-hmm. is like, if you, if you keep, you keep slugging it out and you keep, you know, you can stay up and get to, you, you can go the distance, you get your shot at the title. That's, that's how I, you know, if you can take punches and you can stay in the ring, you can keep, I, I feel like eventually you get a little something, the little something, can, you, it's, it's just, it's an up and down, you know, um, it's an up and down career, certainly. It's like, uh, like many, I mean, you and I were talking about entrepreneurs earlier. Yeah. Now that I've become, through the podcast, I've really gotten very tight with a bunch of very successful entrepreneurs. And I realized, that, and I've always said actors are entrepreneurs who's, business just happens to be themselves, themselves. They brand but themselves. I really see it now through the podcast and talking to other people that they it's very similar in, in terms of like feast or famine you know preparing yourself being ready uh but my industry in particular it's it's very volatile it's Up like and down. it's like pro sports you have this many applicants and you have this many opportunities and, so, and what I heard of is like you can be the biggest shot out there and then all of a sudden you're just it, gone you you can't yeah yeah you can i mean you need to you know you need to be it's like you're consistently in your head trying to make sure that you stay relevant and is that a thing with like with you with you at all or with you in that industry and how things yeah, work i mean yeah in a way like you're you're only as good as your last job and you're not even like it, it in a way it's like sometimes when you finish a job you feel like you're not sure when you're going to work again you know you just mm-hmm. What happens over time, uh, I'll knock on wood because, uh, you know, this is seem, it seems like it's happened. What happens over time is if you've proven yourself over and over again, you feel like at least the down times are Lower. higher than they used to oh, be. Higher. You know, yeah. they're, they're better than they used to be. That's maybe oh, what okay, I'm telling okay, okay. Meaning like the, that, that like you're going to get work again, but you're still going to go through slumps. You're still going to, you, you just are going to go through times when you're not in favor for whatever reason. And I think the job ends up being, how do you keep yourself inspired and keep filling yourself up with inspiration in between those periods when you are in demand? Beautiful. I'm glad you brought that up because my next question kind of relates to that. A lot of entrepreneurs, they go through, I'm going to just call them entrepreneurs. We're all hustlers out there. They go through moments in time where, you know, things slow down. Uh, they get a lot of whiplash or backlash from people around them, society around them, telling them, hey, your dreams can't be fulfilled. It's not going to work out. How did you deal with that? How did you deal with the downtime? How did you keep yourself motivated? How did you make sure things were, you know, like kept yourself sane, I guess you can say. And did you deal yeah. with a lot of backlash from you, from the community around you, from the people around you? 
Um, I know you said your parents were supportive, but what about friends or... I've been really lucky with uh, support group around me. Um, so there's not really been... There's not really been much of that in terms of like people like backlash, I would say. But there's, I would say the the most difficult thing is just like, and it still happens. I mean, it's it still happens. You can do a really great job. You're on a job for a long time, and then that job is over. It's a, a TV show, and it comes to an end. And now you're you are unemployed, you know, and um, you just you don't know when the next thing is coming and you can go you're giving great auditions you're feeling really good about your craft and and still it's like crickets nobody so nobody wants to do you so, not build a credibility in the industry where it's like okay no this i'm saying guy... i think you, i'm saying i think you do but also what happens is it, the further you go along you start to get a little more selective about what, what you want you do. you're you're going like well i maybe i could work on something but i don't want to do do just anything right now okay you know so so that so you're raising the bar for yourself a little bit so it gets tougher and then and then i think the job ends up being like how do you keep yourself from getting cynical which i've done before how do you keep yourself from getting negative which i've done before Uh, i've done all this stuff before (laughs) it's a it's a constant battle not to and like something like you know the podcast which i know you said we'll get into later that has been such a source of inspiration to me outside of my business. Mm-hmm. Even though I'll interview some people in my business, it's it's like my own little thing. It's like my own little sandbox that I've created that keeps me inspired so that when the opportunities do come in, I go in and I feel like I'm in a great head. I'm not thinking, I'm not sitting around every day. Go, I'm writing my own script. You see all that stuff on the wall. I'm, I've got the podcast. Like, I'm busier now when I'm, I'm, I finished the last, the Netflix series in the end of August. Mm-hmm. And now we're in, where are we now? We're Oct- end of October. October. End of October. But I'm not thinking about, I'm, I'm auditioning. When things come in, I'll, I'll go in for them. <clears throat> but I'm not sitting here every day going like, oh man, I hope the phone rings. I hope the phone rings. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm going like, I've got my own thing going on. And when the phone does ring, I'm like, boom, awesome. Put this stuff aside, prepare, go in. Most likely, even if I feel great, they're like, next. Mo- just because that's, the, and I'm not like putting myself down. Yeah. That's just, those are the statistics, you know? It's just like, there's a lot of people going in, and for whatever reason, you can get dinged. Interesting, you know? interesting. So before we get into the podcast, I've always been curious to ask um, one specific question. How's, how's, the fi- how's the family dynamic with you when it comes to like, the specific acting scenes you choose or the things that you do while you're on the job. How does right. like, I, I, I don't know if you want to get too much. I know this is yeah. kind of like deep, but, but it's always been a curiosity of mine. How do relationships thrive when your job is, you're doing things that maybe is specific, like maybe your wife may not be totally okay with. Right. Or, so how, how did you deal with that? Um, well, and it's funny. So I'm just thinking of like the, you mentioned scandal before and people have said, yeah. <laughs> so, so for those of you that don't know on scandal, I came in as a gay male prostitute, yeah. <laughs> which is, I mean, it's like, man, That's you, exactly you, can't, like what's you can't script this stuff any better, yeah. man. Like, so I had like my first day on set, I was like, you know, shirtless and like, you know, in skivvies and I had to do some crazy and stuff. And I've seen that show. So I've seen the scenes. Oh, uh, dude. Yeah. That's the thing. Like you, you meet people and they're like, I know you from scandal you're like oh man what have they seen me do yeah so so uh you know basically so so there's that and people will say to my wife like are you okay with that is that weird and she's like well i'd I'd rather you know he's doing that with jeff perry than angelina jolie you know so so um you, you know to answer your question it's like my my wife is is very cool and very supportive and just be open in the relationship and realize that it's this is what I do. And it's also a lot less, I think it's a lot less like sexy than everybody thinks it is when they watch, if they see a scene in a movie or they see something, it's like, they don't realize that like right outside a frame is like, you know, the dude with the boom. And there's like a whole bunch of guys. There's like, there's like 30 people in the room, (laughs) you know? And when you see it and you see the film and it looks like it's this, it's only these two people in the room, but it's like, that's, so you can't really have like your intimate moment kind of thing, right? Is that what you're trying to say? Well, no, are you, I mean, you need to have the intimate 
moment on camera. But what I'm saying is that that intimacy is not necessarily translating to to real life. Although in, in a lot of cases, it you know, it does. I mean, yeah. th things happen as we've heard all over. But the, you know, the, the job is to be, you know, basically to be uh, public in, or to be private in public. That's like what you have to do. It's like you have to mm. you have to sell that you are completely alone in this scene with this person. But really, you're surrounded by people. By a bunch uh, of so, people. So we've had, you know, I, I haven't <clears throat> honestly... Um, I did an independent film recently where it was like there was a lot of stuff that was going on. And, you know, I get like we have friends of ours that are other parents from our town that come to see the thing. And they're like, dude, you got to make out a lot. In that. <laughs> like that's, you know, and it's like so there there is that aspect. But um, and your wife is cool with all that. Like, it's, I it's, mean, it's... I, she she's been very cool, but I'm sure that there's you know, there's got to be um, it's weird. I mean, it's definitely weird, but it's also, it's, it's what I do and it's what I did before I met her. And so she kind of knows and we, she also sees all of the work that goes into everything that I do. So it's, it's maybe she does, it's not quite the same vantage point as people outside of it would, would have. Think. Okay, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. She sees like the, all of She's the dots that are connected to to get to the moment. So it, I don't know. I think it's a little bit different maybe than, than one would think outside. Understood. understood you, yeah. Does that make sense? Well, which is why I asked you this question. Cause like, it's a very interesting, I'm but, no, but, sure but, I do, but I do know people, some people that are in relationship and, and the spouse is like, you're not doing this. You're not doing that, you know? Um, and, and that's, and I, I get it. That's yeah. fine. Uh, we don't really have that situation. Um, or at least it hasn't been, it hasn't been tested. Like, I, I don't know. I'm not sure what else, what else would happen. I mean, I have done some stuff, you know, but like, <laughs> I, I don't know, you know, I don't know. I feel like it's a, I don't even know how to like qu I ask you this question. Cause it's like a little bit too personal, but it's also like something that I've always been curious about. Cause yeah. I'm like, how do I don't know if there's a right answer. I mean, that's just, that's my answer. I'm sure you could ask, you know, a hundred actors and you might get a slightly different uh -huh. answer as to how they negotiate their relationship and their career. Has she been supportive that. throughout your career ever since you guys met? She's and... been supportive. You know, I mean, she, it's like we both at times can feel like, man, this is a tough industry. You know, mm -hmm. there are just those times when there are the dips, it's tough. You know, there's not as much consistency as if I was going somewhere and clocking in and clocking out and definitely, getting a paycheck. Definitely, yeah. So that sometimes we just have to be with, aware of with, it. Yeah, we have we have two kids. You got to be, you know, you got to be responsible and all that. So nice, nice. So um, getting into before before we get into the whole podcast, the uh, man, the, I had a question completely slipped out of my mind. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so you, after so. Wow, I completely am losing track of my thought. Let's let's, right. let's talk about the podcast a little okay. bit then. Okay. So you started, so you went from acting. How did you go from acting to like aspiring to turning into starting the podcast? I know you said like, is this something that you wanted to do on your time off because you just felt like you needed to fill that time in with something? Or is this like really, where did it start from? Where did it, it come was, from? It, it started um, originally, well, the, the title 10,000 Knows comes from years ago, uh, a buddy of mine who's an actor writer uh billy tangrady he his parents were out from philadelphia visiting and um i was i was at his place and they were asking me how's it, how's it going and i said great you know uh and i said i talked to there are a couple of schools in la that like mfa programs and they're going to graduate and they'll have me come in and talk to the students about what it's like to be a working actor or whatever mm -hmm. and i said basically i tell these young actors like i'm told no for a living and he goes, how many no's do you think you've heard? And I was, I said, I don't know, you know, there's five days in a work week. There's 52 weeks in a year. I've been doing this a long I'm time. I'm no for a living. That's And I was like, yeah. And I was like, I was like, you know, I've been doing it a long time. I'm like, oh, I'm like, I don't know, 10,000 no's. And I had read the Malcolm Gladwell books, you know, mm -hmm. uh, outliers where he talks about 10,000 hours of practice to become an expert at something. 
And, um, and I was like, 10,000 no's, we kind of laughed. And I was like, oh, that'll be my bio someday. 10,000 no's, the Matthew Del Negro story. <laughs> and we just laughed and threw it away and that was it. Then a few years later, um, I was doing voiceovers and a guy told me, I never heard the word podcast. He told me about Mark Marin, WTF. I went and listened and he was interviewing Paul Thomas Anderson. And I was like, this is incredible. This is like a great medium. Like it's so intimate. That's it, didn't think about it. Then I started thinking about myself and all of the conversations I've gotten into throughout my life with some really high achievers. Like I'm friends with some people that are, you know, like ex Navy SEALs and that kind of, you know, mm -hmm. finance guys. And, and everybody has been, has shared a lot with me. And I, and I thought like, I just kind of always thought that's what everybody experienced, but I came to realize, no, people, maybe because I'm really curious about them. You ask and, questions and they yeah, open Yeah, I'm, I'm curious <clears throat> and I don't have an ulterior motive. I'm just interested in how people, what makes them tick. So I was like, huh, I'm getting a lot of conversations. This could, you know, maybe there's something here. And, um, and, and I started just thinking about that and thinking about a podcast. And still from there, it still took me maybe a couple more years. And then I finally have a friend who has a podcast and I started talking to him and he was like, you got to do this, this, this. I started talking to sound engineers. I already had this microphone, which is, you know, like a professional quality, you know, microphone that I use for voiceovers. And then I started looking and what else would I need? And then I got a sound editor who ran me through how to set it up. So all the logistics, that, that's my advice to people. It's like, you don't know, have to know how to do all of this. Just find someone You have does. to have a desire to do it, and then you kind of figure it out, and other people help you. And so I just kept doing that. I was definitely tentative. And I was, before I launched it, I was in Italy with my family, my entire family. And I was on a walk with my brother and my sister. And my brother's like, so what's the deal? Like, what, why are you like hemming and hawing? And I was like, I don't know. I'm like, I'm... I'm like, I'm kind of scared to, to expose myself, you know? And he's like, dude, you made out with a dude in front of millions of people. What are you talking to? My sister started laughing. And I was like, yeah, but it's different. I'm like, when I'm, in, when I'm acting, I'm interpreting someone else's script. You know, there's a removal for me. You, Do you, you know? like mentally just tell yourself, all right, this is just work? Yeah, I mean, you're. It, How do you do it? It is work, but you're. I mean, there's. That's a larger conversation, but it, like, it's a. But, it's different than like for me. The podcast, in a, in a lot of ways, was more intimate because, it's like it's mine. Like, mm. if you listen to it and you, hate it and you come and rip it apart, you're ripping me apart, you know. And so there was a risk in that. And now I've gotten to the point where I'm like, all right, whatever. Some it's, some people aren't going to like it. They'll they'll say stuff, and some people will like it. You'll always and have we'll, critics. I mean, that's you'll always have critics, is, and yeah. that's and that's what you could be doing the greatest thing in the world, and people totally. And a lot of people say if you're not if you don't have critics, you're not doing the right things. You're not being honest enough because you're trying to appease everybody. Yeah, you know. So so anyway, that was definitely like I was scared to do it, and then I went and I worked my first day on Goliath. Uh, the Billy Bob Thornton show I was telling you about on Amazon. And this guy, Mark Duplass, who's a writer, director, actor, producer, uh, he and I were working together. Started, We had a conversation, and it, he's very prolific as a producer and a writer. And he's like, you just got to you just gotta write it and don't be so precious. Just throw it out there. And literally the next morning, it was 4th of July. My family was on the East Coast. I went, we were in another house. I went out back where I had my mic. I just hit record. I sat down and I just basically puked out 18 minutes of what this podcast was going to be. I mean, I threw F-bombs in there, the whole thing. I just like spoke from the heart, ended it, sent it to the sound editor who's in the UK. And I was like, that's episode one. I was like, I don't even want to hear it again. I don't want to hear it because I'll, I'll, I won't post it. You just took it. immediate action. I just needed to, I just needed to like rip the bandaid off and go. Yeah. And then I got a couple of uh, interviews that, that, the guests were awesome, but I posted them and I hadn't listened to them, which was actually a blessing in disguise. I went to New York, I came back and I started listening to this one with this woman, Kimmy Culp, who's very accomplished and very articulate. She's incredible. I listened to it and I almost puked because I interrupted her. I was like throwing F-bombs around. I said awesome <laughs> about, you know, 64 times. Like, <laughs> It was crazy. Yeah, but, but that, that happens. I mean, it, look, like right now, I was like asking you a question. I completely lost track of thought. 
it happens because like you know as not i mean but coming from you though i'm was it are you on camera when your podcast or is just audio? No, it's just audio. It's just audio. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And and I've I've had that debate. Should I, you know, people have told me I should I should be filming it and putting it on YouTube. And I I think business wise, maybe that would be better. Maybe it'd reach more people and maybe I will at some point. I love that it's just audio because people don't have to worry about how they look, what they're wearing, where it is. And I also think it's in a in a way, it's like the most intimate form of of a, of, of a conversation, you could really be like a fly on the wall when you're just listening. Mm -hmm. You imagine where they are as opposed to being, you know, seeing it and it's like it takes out the imagination. I feel like if you're on a run and you're listening, you just imagine where they are. And it's like you're a fly on the wall. It has a powerful wall. thing to it. Yeah, yeah I, and, and I also think the guests, logistically, it's easier to set it up. Yeah. You know, because <laughs> I've had some guests that are kind of heavy hitters and, and you're just like, it's easier to go, for example, Richard Shipp, he, he was on the West Wing. I w worked with him years ago and he's, you know, won Emmys and all that stuff. And we did it at his house and we did it in his office. But like, I wasn't going in there filming it. You know, you we talked about being yeah, here. We did, yeah. There was none of that because he's just, it's like he's in a vacuum. He still had to lend his voice and his thoughts and everything, but he didn't have to worry about getting dressed up or that's whatever. actually That's actually a conversation I've had with my team where it's like, what do we do once we get bigger guests on the show where it's like they barely have time and they're like very specific about their things. Uh, so it's like the video format is definitely a interesting way of delivering a message because I feel like for me, people can connect more when they're seeing your emotions being delivered from the way you speak. Yeah. They can relate. They're yeah. like, oh, okay, he's talking, but he's also feeling like this. I can tell from the way he's, you know, he's yeah. looking. Or See, I don't know. I've, I've heard that all the time, but I don't know if I, if I think that I miss that when I'm just listening. I feel like it comes across in, in just audio. Are you an audio, or do, you, do you learn better just listening? Are uh, you a visual learner, are you a... See, I, it really I do, depends. Like, I, it depends. It depends yeah, for yeah. me. I, mean, I really love depends. to read, I do like to listen now, I listen to tons of podcasts. Um, I, uh, I, I, I almost think that I would rather listen to an interview than watch it. Really? There's something, I really think there's something where the listener can go to the conversation and get right in there. Whereas when you're watching it, you almost want, like, you keep a barrier between mm -hmm. you and, and the people having the conversation. And some, that maybe that sounds No, weird, no, 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 yeah, I'm totally with you. I mean, that's why we, like, there's both iTunes podcasts, there's the YouTube. Yeah. I, 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 the other thing was, I, you know, you talked about the book that I'm reading, The One Thing. Yeah. So I made a conscious effort when I started it. And, and this is starting to morph a little bit because I may start changing this slightly. But I'm, I'm, I knew someone who I was on their podcast and it was uh, as an actor. And it was a really cool podcast, an old friend of mine. Um, and, and it was really good. He had great guests. He did like 10 episodes and he edited them. About a year after I did that, I was preparing this and I went to look his up and I realized he had not done any more than those 10. And mm -hmm. so I emailed him. I said, hey, what's going on with the podcast? And he's like, it's just it's so labor intensive to get each episode up that I just like bailed on it. I have another friend who just does them and puts them out as raw conversations. He gets like 30,000 downloads per episode and he's done like, you know, a couple hundred episodes. That's Jay Ferrugia. Mm -hmm. He's got Renegade Radio and and. And I was like, that's what I need to do. I need to go with like, which one can I do? It's not going to be perfect, but where I can sustain it. Because I, once I do it, I want to do it. Yeah, you know, and I, and I thought, I don't want this to be, it's a lot to be an actor. It's a lot to be a dad and a husband. And all, like, I've got a lot of time devoted to other things. I'm sure. I can't now, you know, camera crew, and we got to edit it, and we got to do, it's like, nope. I'm just going to keep it simple. That's and it. I also I also philosophically like the idea of it's 10,000 no's. The idea is that it's like warts and all. You know, there's a couple of tangents that the conversation goes. I love, goes by the and, way, I totally relate to your vision statement. I was reading it on your site. Oh, thanks. Really, cool. really cool. Because that's kind of what we do over here in this podcast is we kind of want to give the insider scoop. Yeah. And to show the world that, hey, everybody struggles the same. Totally. You know, that's, that's the whole, that's the whole thing. And so I felt like even in the format of the show that maybe it shouldn't be like, I listened to, uh, Oprah super soul Sundays and it's awesome. It's like 30 minutes. 
It's in and out. You know what you're going to get, and it's great. It's edited. It's great, though. I love that, but for mine, I was like, I just, I want it to be more raw and and more kind of maybe it meanders, maybe it doesn't. I, I have an agenda in terms of like keeping an arc to it so that people are not just going all over the place. But sometimes it goes down roads that I didn't expect. And I'll just go down there, maybe loop it back to where it comes. And then and then the listener gets to really hear not such prepared statements. Like because you can you can go on Instagram and get that. You can go on like you know, any kind of PR for people, it's usually like the same statements over and over. Mm-hmm. I'm always like, well, how, how can I get like, what's a different thing from this person that's it, that's that it. makes it like that you want to hear this particular interview with them as opposed to everybody else, 99 others that they've done. Yeah, I, I relate you to know? you a lot. It's so, kind of what I, oh, what I cool. try to do all the time. So I, I, I love it. Um, so what would you recommend for people that are struggling to start something up and just don't know where to begin? have a lot of, you know, this consciousness just killing them, like, oh, they're going to fail. It's like, you know, all these questions, yeah. all these fears. How do you conquer them? How do you how do you just pass by them and just get things going? What's your, what's your number one The number tip? one thing to do is listen to 10,000 no's. No, <laughs> yeah, uh, how, how could it's a good setup. I, could, I, could, I couldn't <laughs> avoid that. No, I would say um, take action. You know, take a step. Don't, don't try to be perfect. It's not going to be perfect. No matter what you think, it's not going to be perfect. And I'm not speaking as someone who does this all the time. Um, I had an episode uh, over the summer that was all about breaking out of your comfort zone. And I talked about me with my writing. And like now you see all these pictures on the wall and these like I have these these outlines on the wall and I'm on the second draft of a screenplay I'm writing. I'm like, I'm I'm in it now. I've been doing it. But I've had so many years I've had decades of like just starts and stops starts and stops because I was too afraid like I wanted it to be perfect and I wasn't willing to show it and get notes and like it just that doesn't do anything Mm -hmm. it's it's a it's a shame like I'm a decent writer it's a shame how much I have that's like unfinished and never given to the world that's like stuck on my laptop Mm -hmm. and and I would say like if you're if you're if you're listening or you're watching this or whatever, it's like if you have something that you're dying to do, just go do it. Like who, who cares? It's not going to be perfect. Guess what? Your first draft is not going to win an Oscar. Yeah. Your tenth draft is probably not going to. Your thirtieth draft is probably not going. So who cares? Just go do it. Get it out there. Be smart enough to get better, and then do the next one a little bit better and a little bit better, and then just like keep, you know. Keep taking one step. And then step by step, taking perfect action. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I remembered the question I wanted to ask. Oh, you. good, good. What yeah, 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 yeah. So what's the advice you would give to people struggling in relationships to find that person that's supportive towards their dreams? How do you cope with it? Or in the sense of how do you how do you at least like, let's say you're in a relationship with somebody who just doesn't really support what you do. Yeah. Do you get out of it? Do you try to tone into it? Have, have, you, have you had like specific practices with your wife that you've implemented to be to create a dynamic between the both of you that's a great question first of all and uh, like i'm not the guy that like has all the answers certainly um but it happens to be tomorrow is actually it'll be 19 years ago tomorrow we went on our first date no way yeah like, so congratulations thanks. <laughs> yeah so that's kind of crazy to, yeah. to even say that right but um we i mean first of all it's like if it's just like the career it's actually just, this is what this is where I, I always laugh. Like people are like, ah, oh, relationship, it's not working, and like they, they get out. You're like, but what have we been talking about this whole time with a career? We're saying like sometimes it's really good and I'm working and I'm in favor, and sometimes I'm in the valley and it sucks, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Relationships are not different, you know. Not sometimes easy. it's yeah, especially and you throw kids in the mix and the whole thing. It's like you're running a business, so it's not. It's not easy. So I my thought said running a business. That's I mean, no, but really you're like, man. you're running like a household. It's yeah. like, I mean, you should see it. It's like, well, they have this, you know, I told you the end of the, I'm like, I want to go volunteer yeah. at the school. Like there's, there, it's like, when, did, oh, you got to get them over to soccer practice. You got to get them over here. You got to drop them at this. They got baseball, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Right. So I, I, I think um, the one thing that, that I've, I've learned recently that I think was really good advice was actually from Bejo's Koulian, who we talked mm-hmm. about. He sent me this book. It's somewhere up there. It's called The Big Leap. And the gist of the biggest takeaway I had was 
it, it was all about like taking ownership. Now you, you can apply this to anything, apply it to your business. Your business isn't going well. It's on you. Your relationship is, isn't going well. It's on you. Your, your kid is not reacting well to your stuff. It's on you. Literally th this guy, uh, what's his name? Gay Hendricks says, he says, if you are in a relationship and you're in a fight, you need to take a hundred percent of the responsibility. Both parties do. And huh. it's not like I, I take 75%, you take 25%. It's 100, 100, which so doesn't make sense. Equal. So, that, so what it ends up doing is like, and I'm not saying I practice this all the time. I'm, I try and I, <laughs> I'm better, but it's like step by step. When, huh? when I found the, the best success with my wife is like when, is when I go, I'm, I could, she could do something that I like don't agree with and I'm pissed off about it. But instead of like going at her, I go, what, 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 like, what is she maybe thinking? Like, what, what is it from her point of view? How is she seeing it? And like, what could I have done differently? Or can I just shut up for a second and let myself cool off hmm. and then figure it out and come back? And, and nine times out of 10, maybe more, maybe 10 out of 10, that is the better thing to do, you know, because you both come back with a cool head. It, it doesn't happen all the time. Trust me. I mean, she's a fiery Irish lady. I'm a fiery Italian. Like it's like, sometimes okay. it's, you know, <laughs> the, yeah, the combination. Mm -hmm. But, um, that's what I would say is like, if you can, you know, luckily she's very supportive, but she's, she's also human and my business is really tough. So there's times when it's like, you know, you get, in you get into it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and my, my, my thought is like, I don't know, you got to, somehow figure out a way to make it, you know, you have to make it work for both parties somehow. Put yourself in their shoes, figure it out. And, and yeah. Do you guys ever actually like just sit down and discuss it? And like, all right, here's the problem. Yeah. We, I mean, we like Open sit communication. down, sit down, discuss it. Like, you know, a lot of times there could be something and then like, there's like a, some kind of a of a head to head and then there's like a, a cooling off and then there's like texts that come back and, and and inevitably we're always like hey i'm sorry i didn't realize you saw it that way i didn't realize that this is how i saw it and then you know so it's 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 tricky i mean it's like it's like the career it's mm -hmm. not easy but if you're making that decision you're making that commitment then that's what you that's like what you got to do yeah. You know, uh, I think you got to kind of like get through those. And then what you find is like, you know, for example, this, this summer we had the, the job, the Netflix show I told you about that's coming out the end. So it was called huge in France. We shot it here. And then the last two When's weeks, the show gonna be coming out? uh, February of 2019 is what it is, what it's scheduled for right now. Okay. Um, cool. and so that we shot the last two weeks in Paris and this doesn't always happen, but it just worked out. My mom was able to come out and watch the kids and my wife was able to come with me. And it was awesome. It was like a second honeymoon, you know, on the job. And I didn't even have that much to shoot there. And it was, and it was great. And it's like, you get through, sometimes there are times that are, that are tough. And then there are times where it's like, it's, it's awesome. Mm-hmm. And then it'll go and it'll get tough Just again. Just a consistent back and forth. It's like everything. It's like everything. I don't think it's. I don't going. think it's any different. I mean, I think it's all the same. Like in every aspect of our life, it's like it's just, it's a constant. You constantly have to work on everything that means something to you. You know, whether it's a relationship or a career, which is really a relationship with your job or anything. Like you, you got to like. It's so, my friend and I were just talking about this the other day. It's so easy. Like when you're in a good, in a good mindset, it's so easy to get knocked off. There are so many things that could, that could like come by and off. swipe you off. There's just, there's just stuff happens, yeah. you know? I mean, life happens. And so, it, so you got to really like try to develop habits and routines so that like when those things happen, you may get knocked off for a second, but then you're like, huh, I'm going to go back. And I'm gonna I'm gonna fall back on my training. Nice, you know? nice. Well, hey, I really appreciate your insight, my man. So, where can people check out your podcast? Where can they see you on social media platforms? Just uh, how can I find you? Where? Um, okay, the podcast is Ten Thousand Knows. That's um, that's at Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can go to Ten Thousand Knows dot com. That's one zero 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 N O S dot com. You can get everything there. 
Um, I'm on Instagram is at Matty Dell, M-A-T-T-Y-D-E-L. Mm-hmm. Uh, on Twitter, at Matthew Del Negro. And then on Facebook, which I'm, you know, a little not so great on. Is <laughs> I have like a fan page there and a personal page there. It's Matthew Del Negro. Cool, cool, cool. Um, Any upcoming yeah. projects you'd like to talk about? Any- I mean, the, the big ones right now are the podcast I'm super proud of and uh, Huge in France, I'm, I'm really excited about. It's, a, it's really, I, I tend to do more dramas than comedies oh, yeah. and, and uh, this is a comedy and we'll see, but as we were shooting it, we felt like it was really, it was pretty funny. It cool. was pretty, I'm, really I'm excited about that, that one, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. All right, so final question for you. Um, a lot of people struggle with just figuring out something as simple as their passion and what they love to do. So what is the key uh, tip or factor or change that somebody should do in their life to be able to figure that out? Mm. Great question. Um, actually, I would say breathe is the first thing. <laughs> breathe is really, honestly, I think there are so many things coming at us these days from everywhere Mm -hmm. like your phone is coming at you whether it's texts or social media or whatever tv billboards there's just everything's coming at you it's hard to know what you think about everything you know because so many people are basically telling you what to think and and i think uh, if you can you know some people do it through meditation or you could do it like my thing, it's like, go, go for a walk outside. If you live, you're lucky enough, like, like we are to be in California and you live near the ocean, go see the ocean. It's huge. It'll, it'll humble you. Go, if you're not, go to the mountains or go wherever. Just, just go out in nature in some way. Just maybe get away from people and be alone with your thoughts and see what it is that you actually are, are, fired up by Mm -hmm. you know and 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 when you see it what happens is i think it's like a lot of people say they can't find their passion and i i don't know i feel like people might have more passion than they realize and but it's just it gets well it just gets sideswiped like you have that you get really excited and then you're like oh but that's gonna make me look stupid (laughs) i don't know if they get if they get uh, I think it's like a lot of times it's internal. Like you talk about 10,000 no's. I think a lot of those no's are coming from the voice inside our own head. I, I feel like I'm someone who's gone after what I wanted to do in, in, a, in a way that's maybe people have said, oh, that's cool that you're going after what you're doing. And I still think there are so many things that I've yet to do that if I'm really honest with myself, it's probably out of fear that I haven't done them yet, hmm. you know? And, and so I'm still working on that. Like, how do I overcome? And, and a lot of times those no's that I think are coming from other people, they're actually just in my own head. They're my own limits I've put on myself. And, and so that's like, that's the job again, is like, how do I, how do I overcome that? So just go out, have some time for yourself. Yeah, take really a take deep, a breath deep. and kind of like and just see what it is that you like. And and I think don't it doesn't have to be fancy, you know? Uh, I be, like that. I like that you said that. Yeah, it doesn't have yeah. to be fancy. It could be anything. I mean you could like knitting. I don't care. Like you could like like whatever. Yeah. Making birdhouses. Just do you it. know, who cares? Just like give it a shot and something that you want to do, just do it and don't think about the end result yet. Just think about the act itself, the process of it. You don't know what it's gonna be like to to knit for a living you know you might hate it Mm -hmm. but just go with the whatever it is that's inspiring you and then see what happens see if doors are open if people come to you if it it makes you feel good if it doesn't put it down and maybe there's something else but but give it a little bit of time to kind of like become something beautiful beautiful man well hey i appreciate your time thank you so much for everything thank you adam you're great man Alrighty, and that does it. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this episode. If you guys enjoyed, please remember to leave a like, a comment, the key takeaway or the key lesson that you got from this specific episode. And also remember to subscribe and share it with all your friends out there. We heavily appreciate the support. And without further ado, I'll see you guys later. Peace. 
And that is a wrap. I appreciate you guys, as always, for stopping by and listening. And if you guys have made it up to this point, y'all are my new homies. So without further ado, please just smash that like button for me and leave a comment down below on your favorite part what you thought really gave you this insider perspective because that's exactly what this podcast is inspired by giving you the insider scoop of what it takes to really create the ultimate success you'd like in any industry so as always too if you haven't subscribed come on what are you doing join the show join the movement and share it with all of your friends to provide as much value as you possibly can by giving back to everybody you love and without further ado i'll see you guys in the next episode